The opinions expressed by tonight's guest do not represent the opinions or position of Spaced Out Radio, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with SOR Media. Listener discretion is advised. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we are about to take you higher. Broadcasting from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Sunday with host Tessa Nicole Thomas. You can follow Tessa on our Facebook page at Spaced Out Radio, on Twitter at Tessa TMT, and you can subscribe to her YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio for the archive. We break our command because we the world. Buckle up, space travelers. Let the countdown begin. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. It's time to go for a ride with host Tessa Nicole Thomas. I'm such a lucky guy, cause after all this time. Good evening, Spaced Out Radio. Secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Plata's on a rocky mountain high, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at mile marker 419.9 in colorful Colorado. It is Sunday, December 23rd, Monday, December 24th, for those of you on the East Coast and beyond, and this is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a rockin' weekend, an awesome day, and an even better evening. I am your host, Tessa TNT, and I am live tonight, broadcasting from beautiful Bayfield, Colorado. We are 150,000 strong nightly on Spaced Out Radio Network, spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, Paranormal Radio, Talkstream Live, 99.1 FM, WQEE in Noonan, Georgia, 107.7 FM, UPRN, Louisiana, Revolution Radio, as well as Deep Talk Radio, which you can find at deeptalkradio.com. Don't forget to head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, where you can peruse the Spaced Out Radio store and read the encounter online dealing with everything strange, paranormal, and odd. So I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Um, Tonight, we will be telling ghost stories. And um, telling ghost stories at Christmas time was a tradition in Victorian England. In fact, it was more common to tell ghost stories at Christmas than at Halloween. So tonight, I would like to resurrect this tradition. So turn off the lights, light a candle, Sit near the fire and cuddle up with your favorite blankie as I tell you some ghost stories this Christmas Eve before Christmas Eve. So, if you guys have ghost stories that you'd like to share, I'd love to hear them. Um, And our number to call in for that is 970-335-9596. That's 970-335. 3359596. And before I get started, I just want to wish you guys all a very Merry Christmas. I hope you guys got all your Christmas shopping and whatnot done and um and you're enjoying your time with your families. So I have a lot of ghost stories of my own um that I've shared with you in the past. Um and I don't know. I mean I've shared them so many times I feel like 
you guys might be getting kind of burnt out on them. So I've got a few stories um, from other people here that I wanted to read to you. And like I said, if you'd like to call in and share your ghost stories, I'd love to hear from you. So this one is Haunted Christmas, and it's a spooky Wisconsin ghost story. And it's told or retold by S.E. Schlosser. The soft thud of following footsteps echoed behind him as he hurried through the snowflakes toward home. They kept pace with him, quickening when he quickened and slowing when he slowed. It was creepy, and his flesh crawled at the sound, and he sped up, cursing himself for walking home alone from the midnight Christmas mass. Normally not a pious man, the middle-aged bachelor had suddenly been struck by a wish to hear the old Christmas songs sung once again by a church choir and had walked across town to attend the service. Now he regretted this choice as he passed a dark house after dark house in the night, snowy night and the footsteps ever followed. He sped up until he was nearly running and skidded into his street. A few more paces brought him to the bottom of his footsteps, and as he dashed up them, he realized suddenly that the following footsteps had ceased abruptly. He glanced behind him at the cross street from which he had just turned and saw only one pair of footprints in the snow-covered street. And then, you know, there should have been two. He frowned in puzzlement and then shuddered as a cold breeze struck him, driving snow against his collar and slammed against the door. Almost, it seemed to pass through the door. But that was superstitious nonsense. His hand was shaking as he unlocked the front door and hurried inside. He expected darkness, but was delighted to see that the yellow glow of the firelight coming from his study doorway upstairs. His old housekeeper, whom he thought firmly asleep in her attic bedroom, must have lit the fire pending his return. He shrugged out of his coat and paused for a moment, amazed to find it still warm and dry, though he had walked through more than a mile of snowstorm. It was almost as if he'd been walking in a bubble of calm air, though he remembered the soft snowflakes hitting his face when he first stepped out of church, before the mysterious footsteps began again. His shudder was interrupted by a shout of greeting as his old friend Annie came hurrying out of the study. His whole face lit up in a grin at the unexpected surprise. The two men shook hands heartily and retreated back to the warmth of the firelight, talking so fast they stumbled over each other's words. Andy had left town years ago to take the government job in D.C., and they hadn't seen each other since. Nearly an hour passed before it occurred to him that his guest might be hungry. His offer of a meal was instantly accepted, but Andy was unwilling to leave the comfort of the fire to eat in the kitchen, so he jogged downstairs alone to fetch some food. He didn't wonder at his friend reluctance to join him in the kitchen. Andy had looked very pale and kept shivering with cold while they talked. He hoped his friend wasn't ailing for anything. A few moments later, he was back with warmed-up meat and potatoes and a couple glasses of beer, apologizing profusely as he handed Andy a plate. For the mis mismatched dinnerware, Andy just laughed and hunkered down to eat. When they were both finished, he showed his friend to a guest room and then tumbled into his own bed to sleep, all his apprehension caused by mysterious footsteps forgotten in the visit of his friend. He jumped out of bed Christmas morning and dashed immediately downstairs to the guest room to rouse his friend. Andy wasn't there, and the bed had not been slept in. That was odd. He ran down to look in the study, but Andy wasn't there either, and one plate full of food was sitting on the end table beside his old friend's chair. It was completely untouched, though he'd seen Andy eating from it the night before. Skin creeping at th at the thought, he ran to the kitchen and asked his housekeeper if she'd seen Andy. But the housekeeper had seen no one either the previous night or this morning. He flopped down on the bottom step of the staircase, completely baffled. Where had Andy gone? It was a mysterious uh, mystery that plagued him all Christmas Day, and he did not enjoy his holiday dinner at all, a fact that annoyed his housekeeper. He was awakened the next morning from a restless sleep by the sound of the front doorbell. He stumbled out of bed and was splashing water from the bedside pitcher onto his sleepy eyes when a knock came at his bedroom door. When she answered, his housekeeper handed him a telegram that had just arrived. 
As she turned back downstairs to pre prepare his breakfast, he opened it curiously, not knowing who would be telegraphing him so urgently. As he read the telegram, he started to tremble. The message was short and to the point. Andy's family regretted to inform him that his old friend Andy had passed away on Christmas Eve in his home in Washington, D.C. He sat down hard on the bed, the telegram fluttering away from his hand. It must have been Andy who had followed him home that Christmas Eve. That would, it would explain the eerie footsteps and the dry coat in the middle of the snowstorm. He'd spent Christmas Eve with the ghost. So I thought that was a, a pretty interesting ghost story to start upon um, with us gathering together and telling ghost stories with each other for this Christmas Eve before Christmas Eve. And um, I so wish I could spend um, Christmas with you guys, but unfortunately, I'm only the weekend gal. But I hope you guys do have a very Merry Christmas and you've gotten all your stressful holiday shopping done. And um, you enjoy your time with your families and have a happy new year full of love and light. And I'm sure I, I believe I'm on this next weekend uh, with Mr. Bill Hauser. We're going to do the radio box and, um, and we have a guest as well on Saturday. But it'll be very interesting. So I have um, another story here and it's called The Cell Phone. Um, before I move on to that one, I just wanted to remind you guys that you are more than welcome to call in and share your ghost stories, as that's what we're doing this evening, resurrecting the old tradition of sharing ghost stories on Christmas. Okay, so this one's called The Cell Phone. A couple months ago, my friend's cousin, a, singer, a single mother, bought a new cell phone. After a long day of work, she came home, placed her phone on the counter, and went to watch TV. Her son came to her and asked if he could play with her new phone. She told him not to call anyone or mess with the te text messages, and he agreed. At around 11.20, she was drowsy, so she decided to tuck her son in and go to bed. She walked to his room and saw that he wasn't there. She then ran over to her room to find him sleeping on her bed with the phone in his hand. Relieved, she picked her phone back up from his hand to inspect it. Browsing through it, she noticed only minor changes, such as a new background, banner, etc., but then she opened up her saved pictures. She began deleting pictures he had taken until only one new picture remained. When she first saw it, she was in disbelief. It was her son sleeping on her bed, but the picture was taken by someone else above him, and it showed the left half of an elderly woman's face. That's pretty creepy. This next one is called Ghost Bro. My house was built in 1904. It is a single-family home, wood frame, setting on a concrete block foundation. I have been living here for about 12 years of all th the weird things that my siblings and me have seen or heard in this house. This one event is my favorite. This happened to my brother. About 10 years ago, my brother and his best friends had started a garage band playing mostly Spanish rock, alternative music, but in Spanish. His friends could only get together on Sunday afternoons, and they would practice into the early evening, and they would usually call it quits by 8 p.m., this was the time I usually showed up and went to bed because I worked the graveyard shift. This happened in late fall, so the days were getting shorter. They had just finished a long session when the decision to head to someone else's house came about. My brother handed his keys to his buddy so they could load up equipment. Everybody filed out of the basement, but the tricky part was that they needed to walk all the way to the back of the basement up the stairs, through the kitchen doorway, down the hall, into a living room, and out into the front porch. Everyone was outside sitting in my brother's porch, or brother's truck, waiting for him. My brother was walking up the back stairs when he remembered that he had left his pancakes in a to-go container sitting on a speaker in the basement. He made the decision to go back. Now, the basement was not clean. With full sight lines, there had been part... Uh, partitions made and the boiler and main heating unit are right smack in the middle. 
So after my brother walks back, he is about to retrieve his food container, when out of the corner of his eye he sees it. It is a shadowy figure right at his peripheral vision. This feeling of dread and uneasiness washed over my brother. We had been taught that if you are in the presence of a spirit or ghost and felt a bad vibe to say a quick prayer or to cuss at it. My brother chose the latter. He basically just told it, Hey, F you. I don't have time for this ish. My brother started to walk to the back of the basement and briskly up the stairs, closing doors and turning off lights as he was walking out. The last light switch is on the opposite side of the front door. Luckily, the door was open and the light from the street lamp was flooded, um, flooding the living room with its amber light. My brother said he felt something at his back, but at no point did he turn around. As he flicked the last switch, the living room went dark, as did the rest of the house. As he stepped out, he pulled on the door, closing it behind him. Still holding his food container in one hand, he jogged down the few porch steps. He walked towards the front gate of our house. Our house resides far from the main street, essentially having a large front yard, but no rear garage. As he closed the gap between himself and his friend-laden truck, he kind of smiled and thought things over in his head. Madam at himself for spooking out when there was really no reason. He climbed into the driver's side of the truck, putting on his seatbelt and getting ready to pull out of the parking spot directly in front of the house when one of his friends asked, Hey, wait, what about your brother? Isn't he coming with us? My brother answered, What do you mean? He went to work early tonight. He is already gone. Do you see his car anywhere? The next question they asked, So then, who was walking behind you when you were leaving the house? Creepy. And I'll take this little uh, moment to pause and remind you guys um, that you can call in with your ghost stories as well. And um, Christopher had shared a pretty cool with one with me earlier. Um, which I won't share because I'm expecting he will call and share that with us. And I'm sorry I'm not responding in the chat room. It's hard to respond and read at the same time. So let's see. This one is called The Rocking Horse. One night when I was maybe 10 to 12, I had trouble falling asleep. My bedroom was the entire top floor of our house, with my bed and such being on the left side and storage closets and a play area being on the right. I was lying in bed when I heard a noise from the other side of the room and see a rocking horse being beginning to rock. It was sitting just outside one of the storage closet doors. It proceeded to rock its way halfway across the room and stopped dead under the ceiling light. At this point, I was freaked out and just buried my head under the blankets and never peeked out again until morning. It was all confirmed to not be a dream as the rocking horse was still in the middle of the room when I woke up. Furthermore, I got a stern reprimand from my parents for being up out of bed playing with my toys well past my bedtime. Their bedroom was directly below the storage closet play area and had heard the creaking of the rocking horse shoveling across the room. It's pretty cool when um, you not only have the experience, but someone else is there to see it or, or hear the repercussions of it. And if you guys don't want to call in, uh, feel free to share your stories in the chat room, and I'll be sure to read them um, for you on the air. And the number again, if you'd like to call in, 970-335-9596. 970-335-9596. I'd love to hear your guys' ghost stories. So this one's called The Following. My older sister has a ghost that's followed her around for years. I lived with her once for about three months, and so much weird stuff happened in that time. All my sister would say to me when I mentioned it was that her ghost didn't like me being there. Things like going to bed with everything locked up and switched off and waking up in the morning with the back door open, lights on, and kettle switched on. Oh, let me see. Alright, I'm going to finish this story really quick and then um, I'll let you go ahead and tell your story. One, mo one night, my sister and I were getting ready to go out and I'd asked to borrow her liquid foundation. I used it and put it back where she kept her makeup. 
Ten minutes later, she's asking me for it, and it was nowhere to be seen. She accused me of taking it and made me buy her a new one and refused to listen to my side of the story. About a year or so later, when she was packing to move to a new house, she found the makeup in a shoebox with some old letters. The shoebox was in a zipped-up suitcase that was underneath her bed. But probably the most scared I ever felt was one afternoon, when I was the only one in the house, which never happened as four other people lived there. I'd arrived home from work and headed straight to the bathroom. All the doors, windows, etc. were closed. I was standing in the bathroom and started squeezing a pimple on my chin when a female voice in the hall said, Stop picking your zits. It was loud enough and sounded real enough, and at the time I thought it was my sister. So I laughed and told her to F off and asked her what she was doing for dinner. No answer. I stuck my head out into the hall. No one there. I searched the house top to bottom and there was no one home. I sought sat out on the front porch until someone else got home because I didn't want to be there alone. All right. So, um, generally I would say an area code, but Miss Fisher, welcome to the show. Hello. How, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Christopher? All right. This whole experience also went to a weird experience I had earlier in the week as well. All right, well, tell us all about it. Um, last week she was put in the hospital for a stroke. Mm-hmm. And uh, the hospital wanted to put her <clears throat> in hospice early, but not give her a chance. So I agreed with, it, with my mom's fiancé to you know, keep her alive until... The family uh, got a chance to see her <clears throat> that very night before I made that just told that just decided to help him with that. I heard loud ringing in my ear, and I woke up to a dream uh, <clears throat> about how great the art. I was in this huge chapel, European in nature, and it was. Everybody was dressed in white, and my white was a golden, fluorescent golden white color. I kept dreaming this song, and I was in this church. And then <clears throat> when she got sicker and sicker and ended up in there, 1 a.m. last night, I was... It was like I was on that writing with another intuitive friend of mine. I wrote to her that she died. I didn't realize I wrote it. And then, like, uh, two and a half hours later, found out that she did. And what was weird, when I nodded off in tween time, I was, I was talking to her in this pub with her mom and dad back in the 50s. It was like she was celebrating being back with her mom and dad. Well, it's so awesome that they were, you know, able to find each other. And um, and we were talking about this earlier, and I was asking you, you know, what message did you get from this? And you were saying that she was happy and having a good time on the other side. She immediately found everybody. Mm Mm-hmm. She crossed over immediately. That's so awesome, and it's amazing, you know, when your family members do come to you. And I find that dreams, you know, it's not just a dream of, you know, somebody that you're missing or whatnot. You know, it's her trying to share a message with you because it's the easiest realm for them to be able to not only show themselves, but share a message. They're able to talk and all these other things that if they were trying to become an apparition and trying to talk to you, generally it comes through as a whisper or, you know, a lot of times they'll come through Bill Hauser's ghost box or whatnot, but it takes a lot of energy to become an apparition or to even speak. So that's really awesome. I know it's very sad and I'm so sorry for your loss, Christopher, but I'm so glad that she came to you and was able to share with you that she had found her family and that she was happy and having a good time on the other side. It was 
amazing that I that dream of being in that cathedral was wild. It was like a confirmation I did right. Well, did you have, um, that story is really amazing. Did you have any other ghost stories you'd like to share with us? And, like, uh, I, I, when I doze off now, I get this loud humming in my ears now like I did that night before. It's all started to happen. It's really interesting. Um, it's like uh, I have a good idea of what this chapel is, too. It was, um, the place where my mom's fiance, Ancestry is one of the places I looked up years and years ago with St. Stephen. I recognized the cathedral. That's so awesome. And I know Bohemia. You've, yeah. And you've had a lot of different amazing dreams that have, you know, shown you so many different messages. And you've actually had some crazy stuff happen in your house, like things being moved and uh, things being shut off and such. Can you uh, share with our listeners a little bit about that? My com- my old computer finally crashed because it blew up. And I had, like, the bathroom going off. I even had, when I was downstairs in the basement by the uh, half bathroom, I'd seen shadows. I felt like I was watched, but I didn't feel threatened. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's like, uh, I'm the one that has the activity. Well, that's not so bad. At least you realize that you do have a gift and you're able to um, kind of take some initiative and do some different things with what you do find. Yeah, I'm finding I'm also somewhat intuitive as well. Uh, I really should have, next time Chris is on, I really should have him tell the story of what what happened to him and I. Yeah. Um, and you can share that as well. I mean, you guys had a, a lot of really awesome um, breakthroughs and amazing things happening there. Yeah, Chris Garcia, your psych, one of the psychics that come on your show. Um, we often time during the shows that we call in with each other, we often ended up reading each other now. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Like how me and Elizabeth do. It 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 really this world is really crazy and interesting. It really is, and I do find a lot of peace and comfort knowing that there is something on the other side, and it's not just you know darkness and you know um, be eaten up by whatever may find you. <laughs> Yeah, it is actually a lot of a nicer world on the other side other than the deceit and the evil spirit. There's only like 1% of it. For sure. Well, that's super awesome. Um, Did you have any other stories that you wanted to share? Um, No, it's just like a lot of confirmations. Mm -hmm. You know, these experiences of what happened to me in the past, that means I'm not just an open-minded person. It means I'm gifted. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you calling That's in. That's more than just being open. Right. Yeah, there's a lot that uh, goes along with it. Yeah, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Christopher. And again, I'm so sorry for your loss, but... Um, I'm glad she came to you and put a happy note on that. And um, I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year with your family. And that this new year is full of love and light and um, more revelations for you. I really appreciate it and thank you. 
No worries. Thanks again for calling in, Christopher. It was great hearing from you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Thanks. You too, Christopher. Good night. Bye. So that was awesome. And if you guys have any ghost stories that you'd love to share, I'd love to hear them. And I'm sure everyone else sit in the chat room as well as uh, wherever else in the universe they're listening tonight would love to hear your stories as well. And um, I'm going to share that number with you guys again. And let me put that in the chat room here really quick. Um, but the number is 970-335-9596. It's 970-335-9596. So this last, uh, not last one, but this next one um, is from An Annie96, and it says, um, well, it's actually called Annie96 is Typing, and it's very, very short. Um, so this is much more of an interactive experience than anything else on the list. As you read through this WhatsApp conversation, you have to manually click enter to make each new message appear. It's as close to a text-based horror movie you'll find. Um, and so I, I suppose that this Annie 96 was typing. Um, let's see if I click on here. Does that pull something up? Waiting. I need some hold music. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. So while playing around with WhatsApp, I stumbled across a weird chat history between two people I don't know. It scared the hell out of me. When I tried to find it again, the app crashed and kept crashing. Luckily, I managed to make a copy, and here it is. A first message. You asleep? No. Guess you're not either. And so Annie 96 is the one saying, are you asleep? And McDavy says, no, guess you're not either. Annie, can't, it's the wind, sounds like cats fighting, what's your excuse? McDavy says, studying with a frowny face. And Annie says, so... That's why they call, uh, so that's what they call porn now with um, a tongue sticking out. Sorry, I have to text, uh, type next each time this pops up. Hold on, let me see if I can fix this. Uh, Annie says, what the F? And then, um, uh, actually, McDavy says, Annie, what the F? Annie says, not denying it, stung uh, tongue sticking out. And then it says, McDavy is typing. McDavy, I still can't believe what Johnny did today. Annie, 96. Me neither. That boy has issues. And this box is kind of in the way. Let me see if I can make it smaller. Annie, 96. What the F... The wind's so loud, that doesn't sound normal. Laugh out loud. McDavy, no wind over here, just rain. Annie, lucky you, I need my beauty sleep. McDavy, damn right you do. Annie, wow. I wish I could move this to where I could see all of these. Okay, let me scroll down here a little bit. What? You mean I look? And then it uh, kind of dreads off. I think I heard footsteps on the gravel outside, said Annie. McDavy, get your crazy dad to check it out. Annie, I'm home alone. The fam are on holiday. Remember, I told you this. McDavy, really? Till when? We should hang out. Annie, they really sound like footsteps, but there's something odd about them. I should look out the window, but my bed is so warm. Wow. 
wow, if this gets any smaller, I won't be able to read it. How do I get rid of this box? Um, Danny said, sure you want to look out the window when you're alone? What if there's really someone there in your garden looking up at you? Tongue sticking out. You see, scrolling down. Oh, it's not allowing me to. Annie said, not funny, David. David said, wow, chill. I'm sure it's nothing. Annie says, gonna check. Be right back. Man. This next box is in the way. So I can't read all of it. Hold on. Maybe I can keep reading this uh, tiny print. It says, if there's something strange in your neighborhood, who are you going to call? Annie is typing. David, there's someone in the garden. David says, what, really? Yes. Oh, wow. Wish I could move this over. What's he doing? It says Annie's typing again. He's asking for something. Let's see. He's ask or looking for something, and he's on his hands and knees in the garden. Wow, this is getting really tiny. Ha ha, he must be high, probably looking for his... I can't even see what that says. So that's sad, I can't even see uh, what all this is saying, because this box that says, tap here to see what they say next. Hold on one second, let me scroll down there. Okay, so McDavy says, Ha ha, he must be high, probably looking for his drugs. Tongue sticking out. Annie said, David, this is serious. What should I do? Dave, McDavy said, Nothing. He'll probably go away by himself. Annie, Oh my gosh. Now he's digging with his bare hands. He's ruining the garden. Let me see. If I can make this smaller again. Man, this is so irritating. I'm sorry, guys, for the delay here. Good lord. Let me scroll it down. She said, he's turning around. What does he look like? Says McDavy. Annie 96 says, David, what the F? This isn't funny. McDavy says, what? Trying to get this to not be behind the box. Okay, so how are you doing that? Says Annie. What are you talking about? Says McDavy. Annie 96 says, I can see that it's you in my garden. How are you writing here without touching your phone? Look up. I'm by the window. Can't you hear me banging on it? He's like, Annie, now you're scaring me. I'm at home. Let's see. I'm going to shrink it and make it big again. This is so annoying. I regret opening this story. I'm definitely not in your garden. That's not me, he says. Stop playing around, says Annie. I can see your face and you're wearing that stupid football jacket you're so proud of. McDavy is typing, and then he says, It must be someone who looks like me. Honestly, Annie, I'm at home. I wouldn't play around like that. Annie says, It has to be a friend of yours, David, playing a sick prank. How else could he be wearing your jacket? McDavy said, There are loads of jackets like that. My friends don't look anything like me. You just have me on your mind. Winky face. Annie 96 uh, six says, He's digging again. And, McD er, and then she also says, effing leave already and then McDavy says Annie do you have a gun in your house and Annie is typing again and says don't be stupid David I couldn't shoot anyone 
McDavy says, you don't have to use it, just show that you're caring. And Annie, typing again, says, doesn't that jacket have your name on the back? McDavy is typing in response. Yeah, the team all got one with their name on. Annie said, I can see your effing name. And McDavy says, what? Annie, what the hell is this, David? McDavy, Annie, that jacket's in my closet. Annie says, F, he's seen me. Why is he smiling like that? He's coming. McDavy says, call the cops, all in caps. McDavy, Annie? Annie, pick up. McDavy, typing again. I've called the cops, told them there's a break-in attempt at your place. They said they're on their way, but I'll take about half an hour. It'll take about half an hour. Annie, are you there? And then Annie, 96, is typing. It's in the house. Can't talk. I have to be quiet. Lights off. I'm in the closet with a knife. Hard to type. Shaking too much. McDavy says, hang in there, Annie. The police will be there in 20 minutes. Do you know where he is? Annie says, it, not he. The look it had when it saw me, David, no person could look like that. McDavy says, Jesus doesn't know where you are? Annie says, no, I grabbed the knife when I saw it running toward the house, and I got in the closet when I heard it breaking in. McDavy says, okay, good, you'll be fine. A druggie doesn't have the brains to find someone hiding in the closet. The police will be there soon. Annie says, oh God, it's calling out to me. It doesn't sound like you, David. Its voice is so deep, filling the house, filling my head. McDavy asks, what is it saying? Annie, 96, typing again. Come out, Annie. I just want to look at you. It keeps repeating that over and over. I have gone mad, David. Is this what it feels like? And McDavy says... Just ten more minutes, Annie. Keep it together. You are so strong. You will you will get through this. Annie, 96. It's coming upstairs, but so slowly. Irregular steps. Why does it look like you, David? Why you? McDavy, I don't know, Annie. Please believe me. Annie uh, says, can you make it stop? Please make it stop. McDavy, I would if I could. I promise you. Annie, it's at the end of the hall. David, I didn't say anything to my parents when they left. I was listening to music. Is that the last time I see them? McDavy says, Annie. And then Annie, 96, is typing again. This has something to do with you, David. Only you can make it stop. Think fast. McDavy, I don't know, Annie. God, please. Annie responds, please. McDavy is typing, as this is in real time. It might be because I think about you so much. I think about you all the time. Annie 96 is typing. So stop. I don't know how, says Davy. Annie says, it's scraping something on the walls, getting closer. Please, David. I'm trying. I'm trying so hard, David says. Um, and Annie's typing again. It's slowing down. Try harder. Typing again. Whatever you're doing, it's working. Any 96 is typing. It's stopped. I can't hear anything. Davy, really? Don't go out yet. Stay put until the police get there. Annie, what should I tell them if he's gone? David, everything, Annie. Everything you told me. Annie, I didn't know you felt that way about me, David. McDavy, I'm so glad it stopped. Annie, can you come over in the morning, David? I really need to see you. Of course, Annie. I'll be there. Great. Can't wait. McDavy is typing. Annie. Dot, dot, dot. Annie, how do I know this is you? Annie 96 went on offline. Makes you wonder what happened. Ooh, creepy. So was it really her? Or did that thing get her and take her over? That is so weird. So this next one is called The Whispers. This is a story I do not often tell. I promise sincerely that this was 
has scared me for life. And although I have looked into psychological explanations for what I heard and natural explanations for what occurred, they remain unsatisfactory. When I was a child, I was scared of the dark. I swore to my mother I heard voices in it. They were not evil, but they were not familiar, and so they scared me. It was not uncommon in the middle of the night for me to wake up and hear whispers, as I would call them when asking my mom. She figured they were just bumps in the night and the typical kid's nightmare material. I tried often to explain to her that it was more than that, that they sounded different from one another the way people's voices do. On some nights, I would get scared from these whispers that I would sleep in my mom's bed with her. It was an added bonus that the bathroom was directly outside her bedroom door for my late night tinkles. I should add at this point that when walking out into the hall to go to the bathroom, you look directly down the stairs that would lead you into the living room on the first floor, as my mom's bedroom was on the second floor. On one such night, around Christmas, I awoke and felt the need to relieve myself. I walked from out from the door and distinctly heard the phrase, look, and to my astonishment, a red light, almost like a spotlight, was cast upon the wall at the very bottom of the stairs. The light had no other source. It was by itself and it, had, it was transfixed. He was transfixed by it. Being a little kid and it only being a few days from Christmas, I knew what this light was. It was Santa. How else could he get into the house to know I was being a good boy? I was so excited, I began walking down the stairs to greet him, picking up my pace after the second step as he began to creep off the wall and fade into the darkness in my living room. That's when I heard him, a very strong, masculine voice, different from the first, not at all like my father's, not to say he isn't masculine. It was just distinctly different. It said, stop, right now, go back up those stairs. I listen, turn around, and what ne happened next, I'm not sure I would believe if someone had told me the same story. After reaching the top of the stairs, I heard a very loud crash that sent me running back to my mother's bed when I jumped straight under the covers and stayed there the whole night. When I awoke the next morning, the poinsettia lights, little Christmas flower lights that glowed red my mother had put on the railing down the stairs were pulled straight down to the bottom of the stairs. Some broke from what seemed like a forceful tear, laying in a single pile. The dry sink in my living room had fallen from the wall. My mother could not explain it. My father would, was worried we had been victims of a home invasion. My sister was crying. There was nothing missing. Nobody had broken in. There did not seem to be any reason that this had happened. And then I saw it, and I kept quiet about it because I was so afraid that I could not force words out of my mouth. There on the edge of the wooden dry sink, which had been facing up, were three indentations where the finish on the wood had been worn, almost as if a forceful grip had rubbed them off. Something down there had grabbed it and threw it down. That was what the bang was. I was mortified. After that day, I never heard a single voice again. I do not like to imagine what was waiting downstairs for me that night if it was anything at all, but I can tell you that the realities, the reality was that something had physically acted upon two things in my house near the bottom of the stairwell. After this, I had never heard another whisper again, which is sad because in some ways I would have liked to thank the man, masculine energy, that had stopped me from going down those stairs. This happened when I was seven. I am 20 years old now, and because of this incident, I am still afraid of the dark, especially shadowy stairwells. That kind of reminds me of a story when I was a kid, and um, it was the year after my mom had passed away. She was killed by a drunk driver in a car accident, and um, and my dad's in there by himself, up late, um, wrapping presents, and I'm hearing him all of a sudden talking to this man, and like in this story, um, it was a lower, like, masculine voice, but you would imagine Santa Claus's voice to be... And they were talking back and forth about all kinds of random things. And then the next day, um, which was Christmas, I told my dad what I had heard. And he's like, there was nobody here. And I was like, I heard you talking to someone. And I'm pretty sure it was Santa Claus. He And he denied it. I don't know. 
I'm thinking, like, I would have played along with it had it been me and been like, yeah, Santa Claus was here. But, um, that was pretty interesting. So this next one is called The Grandfather. My grandfather told me the story how one time he was sitting in a chair in front of the house when he heard his wife repeatedly calling him from inside the house. The thing is, my grandma passed away a few years before that, but he told me that the voice was so pressing that he actually got up to look inside the house, and as soon as he got inside, he heard a loud crash behind him and turned around to see that the chair he was sitting in moments ago had been crushed by the cast iron gutter that fell on it. If he hadn't come inside the house, he would have probably been seriously injured. I don't know if it's paranormal or not, but every time I think about it, it sends chills down my spine. It's pretty interesting when stuff like that happens. It's always good to listen to that voice, uh, especially if it's a voice that you recognize because it could be trying to help you. This next one is called The Crib Shadow. I was babysitting my niece once while I was staying at my brother's place and they had the baby camera set up so I could see her on the little TV it came with. I was studying and started dozing off when I heard some whispering and I realized it was coming from the monitor. I initially thought it was some feedback or something, but when I looked at the TV, there was a dark shadow near my niece's crib. I have never been more terrified in my life, but the shadow was clearly there where it had not been before. I ran to my niece's room and looked around and saw nothing, but I took her the hell out of there. I went back to the TV and the shadow was clearly gone. I told my brother what happened and he pulled me aside and told me not to mention it to my sister-in-law because she'll freak out, but that he had seen that same thing several times now with the same whispering. They stayed in that house for about four more years and when my niece was just learning to talk, she would tell her mom about her special friend. To this day, it scares the ish out of me. When they moved out, my brother told me my niece had become inconsolably sad because she would miss her friend. Her mom would tell her she could bring him along, but all she would say is that he couldn't leave the house. We have never to this day told her about the shadow, and she apparently never saw it. But perhaps to them, it looked like a shadow, and to her, it just appeared to be her friend. Okay, so this one, let's see. I thought it was the same story because it's called The Shadow, but the last one was called The Crib. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't know that's what it was called until March later, or much later. I was living in a house on Laguna Beach that had been there since the 1920s. In its history, I had been a speakeasy and a brothel and a house for smuggling illegal immigrants. One day, my new wife and I were having an argument. I can't even recall what it was about. She walked down the block to get a cup of coffee and cool off, and I was alone in the house. The way the place was built was incredibly haphazard. There was a bedroom and a living room on one side, then a bathroom with two entrances on the other side of the bathroom was a hallway that had windows on one side and two bedrooms on the other. From my bedroom, I could look across the hall into the bathroom. Then through the bathroom and down the other hall, I was standing at my dresser and I just noticed movement out of the corner of my eye and looked down there. There was, and honest to God, this gives me goosebumps just typing it 17 years later, a black figure. It was maybe three feet tall and it was only vaguely humanoid. It looked like a black like black scribbles, like someone had scribbled a human shape, but the scribbles moved like electricity arcing, and that's the best way to describe it. There was no sound that I could remember. I distinctly remember when I saw it, I wasn't afraid, just like, what the F? Then it noticed me looking at it. I can't say I turned around. It just focused on me, I guess. Then I was scared. I didn't move, didn't scream, nothing. I was just frozen because it just came at me. It brushed down the hall towards me. I have no idea what it intended, but as soon as it entered the bathroom, the door closed. The door clo closest to me just slammed, shut on it. 
I screamed. I yelled for my wife. She wasn't home. I went outside into the daylight and didn't go back in until she came home 10 minutes later. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe I saw something supernatural, but I know I saw something, but I don't know what it was. Let's see. This is actually a long one. I don't know if I can get through that before the next minute. Um, but yeah, we've had all kinds of interesting, crazy ghost experiences here in this house. And, um, you know, sometimes when you have something dark like it, like that in your house, it does cause chaos and contention and unneeded or unwanted fights in between, you know, family members. Ghost had to go, said Jason. Yes. Ghost had to go to the bathroom, but the bathroom door slammed or the closet door slammed. But yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if all beings that appear to be shadow beings are shadow beings because different spirits appear in different ways. Sometimes you'll see the darker figure and sometimes you'll see the lighter figure or sometimes you'll see something that looks just like you and me. So it's hard to decipher between the two. But on that note, we're going to go to our first commercial break. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after these messages. Looking for nighttime adventure? Old school radio that delves into everything out of the north. Then check us out at Spaced Out Radio. This is Dave Scott. Every Monday through Friday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, we're going to take you on a wild ride ranging from conspiracies to true crime and every ghost, alien, and Sasquatch story in between. We're always live and we're always interactive with you. So join us at spacedoutradio.com, where together we own the night. Hey, guess what? You can now get your brand new Spaced Out Radio swag at spacedoutradio.com. We've brought the store back with all new items for you to pick out and pick up for yourself, your family, or friends. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, we got it all. All you have to do is head to our website and click on store. Choose what you want and it's shipped to you. The Spaced Out Radio store is right there for you. Come shop with us at spacedoutradio.com. Then we can own the night together. So you love talk radio. Then you'll love talkstreamlive.com. Talkstream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. If you're heading to Vancouver, make sure you stop by the official bar of Spaced Out Radio, the Moose Vancouver. It's the place to party in YVR at the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is always up to speed with a kitchen staff that serves great food, all food on the menu, $6.95 to $8.95. There's a reason the Moose Vancouver is recognized as one of the hottest spots on the West Coast. Get your horns up for the Moose Vancouver. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. 
The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? A timepiece is a reflection of who you are, and what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You can follow Tessa on Twitter at Tessa TNT, on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to Spaced Out Weekend host, Tessa Nicole Thomas. Here's a sound again, voices dancing in my head, smile. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in tonight, where we're trying to resurrect the old tradition of telling ghost stories during Christmas time, which back in Victorian English times was more popular than telling ghost stories during Halloween. And if you guys, our listeners, and folks in our chat room would like to call in and share your ghost stories or experiences, give us a call, 970 335 nine five nine six nine seven zero three three five nine five nine six and we'd love to hear from you and hear your ghost stories i always love hearing other people's ghost stories it makes me feel like not such a weirdo (laughs) but that being said we're going to move on to our next story before i do that i'm going to take a quick drink here um i wet my whistle as i just finally ate the food that my daughter brought in to me right before we kicked off. It was actually really good, and it was awesome of her to bring me dinner. Um, We've had a a lot of hard incidences with, you know, the anomalies and such in our house causing contention and chaos, and and so um, we had a little bit of something going on last night, and um, I don't know, I kind of attribute that to just being a teenager and full of teenage angst, but it was awesome that, um, she brought me food and she was so sweet and she told me she loved me and it made my heart warm and all a flutter. So, um, uno momento as I take a drink here and then we're going to proceed to our next story that is called The Princess. And again, um, if you guys would like to call in with your stories, 970-335-9596. Alrighty. 
So, how did the princess take control of our message board? If only for a few seconds, it didn't make any sense. Our message board wasn't a video game. Our message board pulled all of its information from the internet. The princess was already inhabiting a game at the same time. All the rules we thought we knew, all the things we thought kept us safe had failed us. Could she have done this at any time? Could she do it again? Were there any real limits to what she was capable of? We looked through all the data we'd collected. We tried to find some common thread we'd been missing. There must have been some way we could have known. There had to be more answers than what we were seeing, and there were. We finally realized the truth. It was so obvious. The princess had been on our message board the whole time. She was on every page. She was on every forum list. She'd been staring at us, watching us for years, and we never even saw it. She was the banner at the top of the forum. She was every screenshot we'd posted, every video we'd uploaded, and every piece of fan art we'd drawn. Okay, my down button. Okay. Every image of her is her. Every image of her we observed gives her power. She's not a ghost. She's not a computer virus. She's an idea, i.e. living fiction. She lives off our observation and thoughts of her. When we all watched that stream, banded together, and gave her all of our attention all at once, we made her more powerful than she'd ever been before. We made her strong enough to manifest through the images we'd posted on our message board and speak directly to us. We took down all the images from what we speculate. It's enough to simply never look at them again. But we deleted them all just to be certain. However, it may already be too late for us. I've been losing contact with other members of the society. I can't tell if something's happened to them or if they've simply gone into hiding. But at this point, only a fool wouldn't consider the worst case scenario. I'm not completely heartless. I know she's fighting for her survival. For her, being forgotten is death. She knows what she does in the hopes of keeping her memory alive. To that end, perhaps my telling her story to the world is a small act of mercy. Maybe the thoughts I've lent her will ease her pain somewhat. I don't know, but either way, that isn't why I wrote all this. What I've told you could put you in great danger, but it could also save your life. You're a target now, and in the months and years ahead, she may well come for you but I've also given you all the knowledge you need to keep yourself safe. Do not try to fight her. Do not try to talk to her. Do not try to outsmart or trap her. Don't investigate. Don't try to understand. Don't try to be a hero. Don't try to be her savior. It's my sincere hope that I've given you all the answers you want, so you won't make our mistake and try to investigate further. There is one and only thing you need to be safe. If you see her, turn off the game. I wonder what game that is. I'm so curious now. So this one's really short. This one would have worked for that last minute right before the uh, commercial break. It's called The Photograph. And it's like two sentences. My friend took this picture of his cousin in their new house. He says it was just the two of them, but that's not what it looks like. The end. This one is called The Satellite Images. A friend of mine showed me how to use Google Maps. I'm sure you've seen it. It's let, it lets you use satellite images to look at locations all over the world. A few years ago, I was in a car accident. Since then, I really don't leave the house that often. It's difficult, and the idea of seeing a car drive by me makes me feel lightheaded. I was fascinated by the fact that I could see all over the world, almost like being there. I could virtually walk down the streets, and it almost felt like I was really there. I became instantly hooked. It gave me a real eye on the world. I could go to almost any major city, and I did. I'd seen the streets in China, Japan, Germany, and England, so many places, I'd never ever gone to tourist attractions like the Great Barrier Reef and Dracula's Castle. 
My favorite was to go to random places in major cities and see how many people and animals I could find. The faces of the people were always blurred to protect their privacy, but it was still enjoyable to see them out there enjoying their life, walking like it was no big deal. She must have good taste, I laughed. I zoomed in closer and noticed the gray bag she carried on a gray and purple shoulder strap. She was walking in a relaxed manner, one hand trailing the wall beside her. I bet if I could see, I could have seen her face, I would see that she was smiling. I began to feel a little sad. I let my hands fall onto the arms of my wheelchair and looked at her for a minute more. I wished that I could be there, walking so carefree with her. That wouldn't happen, though, until I died. I was stuck in this chair. I sighed and zoomed out of Tokyo. Enough of this for tonight. I turned off the computer and went to bed. I got up early and decided to look around Paris. Paris was always fun. I liked the look of the city, with all of the old beautiful buildings and so many people to watch. I randomly zoomed to an area and saw a street lined with old brick buildings, a few small shops, and an old tan brick church. Ahead was an intersection and dozens of people walked by. A balding businessman walked quickly past, looking back at an old woman hair covered with a scarf, carrying a large purse. A curvy woman in black pants that were too tight stared into the store window, and two women led a group of small children around the corner. I spun the view around a few more times and then saw something peculiar. Sitting on the bench at the bus stop were two people. One of them was a young man, sorry, one of them was a young woman with her feet stuck in front of her in a relaxed manner. She is wearing a pair of red sneakers, like my own. I was startled for a moment as I noticed black pants, white t-shirt, and black hooded jacket. Her dark brown hair was tied loosely behind her head. A gray bag sat on the bench beside her, the shoulder strap hooked over her shoulder. This is crazy, I thought. It can't possibly be the same woman. This is a different country, different continent even. How could it be her? This was stupid. It wasn't if, as if these were live photographs. They were taken ahead of time and then stored. It's not like she was in two places at once. She could just be a traveler. Besides, without seeing her face, it was impossible to tell it was the same person. Brown hair was probably the most common hair color in the world. Those red sneakers were something I purchased online. I'm sure a million other people did too. I shook my head and went to fix some lunch. When I got back online, I decided to look at Berlin. I picked a random street as usual. It looked pretty empty. There were brick buildings lining the streets, looking more like factories than anything else. There are also empty lots, full of long grass and piled gravel. There wasn't much to see at all, really. There was a line of motorbikes and a car with two German flags sticking up from it. After more searching, I found one kid. He looked like he was dressed for school. A jacket thrown over his bag, he was intently looking at some kind of mobile device. I was disappointed. I started to leave, but then I caught something out of the corner of my eye. I turned the view, and there they were. Those damn red speakers, or sneakers. She was standing on a street corner next to some kind of signpost. She had a hand on the post, looking down the street, as if waiting to cross the street. I stared in shock. How could she be there, too? Even if she was traveling, there's no way I would find her every time. Even finding her in Paris would have been one heck of a coincidence. But this? This was crazy. This was some kind of joke. Had Google decided to play a prank on its users that use their products so much? I... I... It would have been a great joke. I did a quick search looking for a note about the woman that shows up like Waldo. There was nothing. I looked through articles on strange things you can see on Google Google Maps, but none of them mentioned the woman that traveled the world with you. This was crazy. Had my self-imposed isolation driven me mad? Had I become so lonely that I created a hallucination for myself? Leaving the Berlin image on my screen, I sent a text message to a friend asking him to look at the locations. I asked him if he saw the same woman. Then I waited, hands sweating heart thumping in my chest. I jumped when my phone beeped with a return message, ten minutes later. The text read, 
I see the lady you're talking about in Berlin. I didn't see her in Paris or Tokyo. Is this some kind of game or what? Are you okay? I didn't respond. Instead, returning to the locations in Tokyo and Paris, there she was. She was there, but it was different. She no longer sat on the bus stop bench in Paris. She was standing in front of it, looking for something in her bag. In Tokyo, she was blocks away, squatting down to pet a calico cat. I shivered. Who was she? What was happening? I switched my map to Brussels. It was another city street. It was lined with old-looking buildings, with shops on ground level, and what I guessed was apartments above. I quickly scanned the streets. They were empty, other than a stocky woman in a bright blue sweater. I did a second sweep. She wasn't there. I sighed in relief. I couldn't believe I was getting so worked up about this. It was nothing but a co- I stopped, my eyes frozen on the screen. There was a building at the point of a fork in the road, white with a black ironwork frame balcony jutting from the second floor. I hadn't seen her as I had been looking at the sidewalks. There she stood, standing on the balcony, her head tilted in the direction of the camera, almost like she was coyly looking toward me. My breath caught in my throat. I switched to Sydney. She was leaning against a wall inside the doorway of a blight, uh, bright blue Carrick's Pharmacy building. London show her getting ready to step onto a red double-decker bus, her head turned to look over her shoulder. She was everywhere I looked. She stood on a brick sidewalk on a bridge in Venice. She walked across a yellow barred crosswalk in Zurich and in Hong Kong. And she stood between a wing lung bank and a McDonald's adjusting the strap on her bag. And each picture, she came closer and closer to looking directly at me with her blurred out face. My heart felt like a terrified bird slamming around inside my chest. I couldn't catch my breath and I wasn't sure what to do. I couldn't call the police. Should I send screenshots to Google? I clenched my fist tightly and closed my eyes. Who was she? Was she following me? Was I following her? I wish I could see the expression on her face, know what she saw when she looked back at me. I wanted to get out of the chair and run. Why is it that the only thing that made me feel free again was the thing that made me feel even more trapped? I had to know. I typed in the name of my town and zoomed into random streets. It was a couple of miles from my house. The gates of the city park were shown in the clarity of daylight. Despite it being night here, there she was. There. There she was. She was only a few miles from my house, standing under the ironwork arch that stated the name of the park. She looked directly at the camera, directly at me. I felt like I might throw up. She was near me, and she was watching me. She was coming for me. What did she want? I typed in the name of the apartment complex where I live. I could see the outside of the building. The parking lot was full of cars, and there were a few blurred out children in the playground. I searched everywhere for her. She wasn't in the parking lot or on the sidewalk, not hiding between buildings or standing in the playground. I even scanned each of the cars behind the bushes and each of the blurred windows. She wasn't there. I curled tightly around myself and lay my head down on the desk. This place was safe. I didn't leave the apartment anyway. I would never use Google Maps again. I would never see her again. She could stay at the park for all I cared. I smiled to myself and was surprised to find a tear slipping down my face. I'm safe, I said to myself in a whisper. It felt good to hear it out loud. I'm safe. As I said it, there was a knock at the door. A chill ran down my spine. I had a camera hooked to my computer that showed who was at the front door, which made it easy for me with my mobility issues. I slowly reached for the control to show myself who was outside, but my hand trembled furiously. As I touched the control, I realized my mistake. The last of Google images that I'd seen had only shown the outside of the building, just outside. I looked at the screen and I saw the woman in a white t-shirt, black pants, black hooded jacket, and carrying a gray bag with a purple and gray striped shoulder strap. Of course, there were those red sneakers. She looked directly at the camera, her face still a complete blur. As I tried to stifle a scream, she raised a hand and knocked loudly on my front door. 
Ooh, that was creepy. I'm looking over and uh, not seeing any more comments, but I think we probably reached 300 comments over there. Um, so I'm unable to see it unless I look on this computer. But as, as I said before, I'm reading these stories, so it's hard to keep up um, with your guys' comments. So here I'm pulling up um, some more ghost stories. And that one uh, was pretty creepy because, like she was saying, you know, these pictures aren't live. These are pictures that, um, that are stored, that are taken previously to the date that you're looking. Um, but then this lady is all over the place and even at her front door with her own camera, still with the blurry face. That was just creepy. Creepy. I got, I actually got goosebumps on my legs f there for a minute. I don't know about you guys, but Hey. Ooh, the real hat man. This one looks like a good one. What do you guys think? Let's see how long it takes to pull this up. In the meantime, we can jump over here to Skinwalker stories because I love them so much because of experiences that I've had and also experiences that my friend, friends have had. And I know I've told you guys about my skinwalker experiences um uh, uh living in cortez colorado at the base of sleeping Ute mountain in a you know one of those brand new modular trailers one night on the back porch smoking i saw glowing eyes out in the field and then one pair turned into two three four five six like i don't i don't think i could even count all the sets of eyes and they were all fixed on me and all approaching me but they would stay just outside of the light of my back porch. And so I got up and ran really fast into my house. Um, another occurrence was in between Cayenta and Tuba City, Arizona. And we were on our way down there to Phoenix this last Christmas. And um, so we're talking to the kids about skinwalkers, about being, you know, on the reservation and all this other stuff and um, different experiences that we had had through our life with skinwalkers and so we're telling them keep your eyes out you know look out for them and make sure you're really quiet and you're listening you know a good way to keep the kids still and quiet and and fixated on something um all of a sudden and I've told this story before but this was around Christmas time so we're going to use this story um all of a sudden we see this red and white truck on the side of the road with all the interior lights on headlights on and the driver's side door open, and nobody to be seen anywhere around the truck. Um, not even 50 yards down the road, there's this, I have to say, six foot, whatever, blonde, pale lady, and she had um, just below her shoulder length blonde hair, and she's looking the opposite direction, and she's wearing the shirt that's kind of up and over her belly because her belly is so big. At first glance, you would think that this girl was pregnant. Um, at second glance, you realize she's not pregnant. It looks like she had eaten like a human. That's how huge her stomach was. And her pants were popped open and stomach protruding from her pants and her shirt. And um, her arms were so long and lanky, her hands were actually below her knees. And... Um, she was looking the other direction, which I was grateful for because different friends of mine that are native have told me if you make eye contact with a skinwalker, um, they can take control of you, which I'm not sure if that's true or not, uh, because I was basically seeing the eyes of these other skinwalkers that were surrounding me in my backyard on the back porch. Um, and they didn't take control of me at that point, but I'm still glad I just didn't see her face because I could just imagine how creepy and scary and you know, she already haunts my dreams. Like I could just imagine seeing her face and having that haunt me forever. Um, but as you guys know, I work overnight security. I work 7 PM to 7 AM during the week. And there's a native guy named Sherwin that sometimes stays on the job site and sleeps in his truck because he lives in Shiprock, New Mexico. And he was telling me a story of how he was driving down the road 
and he saw a man off in the distance, and as he got closer, he could see he was wearing black jeans and a white shirt and, like, a, you know, black pull up, like, button-up shirt that was open in the front walking across the road. And as he got closer, the guy didn't, like, dissipate as a ghost might. He said that this person broke up into, like, three or four different black crows and flew away. That was pretty awesome. Um, my daughter, and I wish she was calling in tonight, but she's not going to, so I'll probably end up sharing her story as well. Um, but she had told me that her roommate was telling her about his experience, and it was in between um, the same area where, where we had seen ours. And he said there was this really large-looking wolf sort of dog that ran out in front of his vehicle. And it looked like it was injured when he first saw it on the side of the road, but it intentionally ran out in front of his vehicle, trying to make him stop. But he didn't stop or swerve or have an accident or anything. He just kept driving and hit it. And then he, the way he described it, um, I don't know if you've seen uh, Residue on Netflix, but the way that this black, wispy, smoky thing like kind of turns into something but he saw this black wispy smoky stuff and like burnt paper looking stuff you know go over his hood when he hit this thing and then looking in his rearview mirror uh he could see it was no longer a large wolf it was actually a man who is naked kind of crouching and hunched over in the middle of the road so that was pretty interesting and intriguing all the different experiences that I've heard about that. Um, so I'm going to move on to the story and then I'll tell you the story that my daughter told me this last week of some experiences she's been having in her house where she lives with her boyfriend and, and their roommate. So here's a skinwalker story and let's see, I can't see who wrote this just yet. Maybe it'll say it at, at the end, but it starts like this. My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story how my grandfather died, but honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV or sometimes you hear stories over something in a public place. People talk about ghosts and aliens and you think to yourself, that isn't real they're making it up, or they're mistaken, or they're crazy, or something like that. You just can't believe it until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it. Even though he swore up and down it was true, it wasn't until I started clicking around the internet I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not my, what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet site in his life. He wouldn't know the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after an old Navajo hotel his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night. He'd tell me coyotes would kill him for 50 bucks a skin. They live in a dairy farm on Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes while we were out, we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind, and it could feed a family or a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home, walking because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We'd cut through the woods. That's when it came up on it, when we came up on it. Blood everywhere, splattered on trees, in the grass, in the creek, everywhere. At first we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We'd seen it sometimes. They can't scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs, but this wasn't like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off one that's weak or sick or old or just small. 
They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can't go out of, and they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see the alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its throat is gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick, it's clean. That wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den. Wolves neither, because they'd get too much of a fight. There were three, I think three bodies, just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg here, a torso there. Predators don't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses, and we think it's something we got to take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. But I wasn't leaving him, and I damn sure wasn't walking through two lines of woods alone. With nothing but a twenty-two and a pocket knife, he was only thirteen at the time, so a twenty-two rifle was about the only gun he could re- reliably use. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't hard either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I'd never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life. I've been all over the world. And I never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard these things screaming. Heard deer and fox and rabbits and raccoons and birds just scared. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock. Except the fox and some birds, nothing was supposed to even be awake. But they weren't just awake. They were moving. I saw flocks of birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple, thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us. They ran right past us, didn't even notice. Then some deer did the same. Then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes, even a couple wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other, and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together that maybe whatever we were tracking, it wasn't something we were supposed to see, and it wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature, to go toward trouble, to fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks then. A lot of animals fleeing the forest had paved our way, or paved our land, but where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step, like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds, but that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighed 40 pounds wet, nearly tore out of a damn throat once. All that means is that it's quick and hard to hit. So, we follow the tracks, and it doesn't take us long to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of a hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado, but nobody lived there, not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there, sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high, but we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise, a screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech, another was a low-pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can't remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers, I gotta stay behind him, because we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator, but we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single feral dog, probably rabid. 
The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting it till it don't move anymore. Then slit its throat. If it gets to dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get off of him. So he walks up, and I'm right behind him, just a tad to his side, so I can see what it is. I wish to this day I hadn't. I was lean- It was leaning over a carcass, tears off its flesh, and throws what it doesn't nibble at aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers and claws at the end. So we see that, and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't ever heard true silence before that and not after it, but for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise, which made it all the louder when it turned around, made the shrill cry, and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind, but it was on him. Tears parts of him off. I start shooting with... It with a twenty-two point blank, but it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the gun butt, but it wasn't budging. It didn't even register that I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin, his tit, then moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then it started digging in and ripped off the bottom half of his jaw, the little bones that the tube in your neck, and then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow my dad's knife ends up in this thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and my God, I'm running faster than I'd ever run before or after, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house, because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I see. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance and he looks at me and I'll never forget what he said. What is that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad, most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly we hear it screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save him somehow, but my dad had been gone before I ever picked him up. He was to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside, and they're locking doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me, what happened? What happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous there. All the lights in the house are on, and someone calls the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and see it walk in front of the fire they'd made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly something goes through the window. We shoot at it. But ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog, just the body though, not his head or legs. We start pushing things in front of doors and windows, and we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass just get ripped apart. We put a couch and TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet, not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, except now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out because it was inside. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as that thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that, but the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger, cut its hand off clean. That only pissed it off, though. It started pushing on that door, clawing. We were on the other side, pushing as best we could, and it was on the other doing the same. 
That wood just wasn't going to hold. So someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the hop, uh, top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing, and there are splinters everywhere, two or three of them just unloaded on top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door, what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off it. They put me in a hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back, not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job from the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about the thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how they could say that when they had the hand. He looks at me stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, and died on impact. The hand was never found, probably taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. The cops never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole GD US Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I don't think my father felt he had anything left and that he might as well settle old scores. He went to the woods. He never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved. But I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year, about someone up and vanishing. But that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he wrote, The Rake, onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I searched for it on the internet. Honestly, I would have rather not known. That was creepy AF, right? Holy shnikes. Could you imagine? That was crazy. So let's see. Where are we? So yeah, somebody was asking um, here in Messenger about the after party tonight. And um, every weekend after the show, we always do an after party. I like to call it SOR Asylum After Party. And um, tonight we're going to do something a little different. Um, we're going to sit and talk and, you know, have drinks together and whatnot, um, just as we generally do. But tonight at 3 a.m. in the morning, we're going to do this uh, 3 a.m. Siri challenge. And that's where you call or pull up Siri on your phone and ask her different questions. And supposedly um, she's really dark or becomes possessed. I haven't tried it yet. Um, my daughter who told me her ghost story, um, she's the one that recommended it this morning. She's like, mom, you got to do this for your, um, for your after party. It would be awesome. So I'm going to try it. I'm going to see last time I messed with AI, which I hate doing because anytime I've seen videos of AI on the internet, um, they always have one thing in common as far as, um, you know, they're, they're just wanting to take over the world, basically, um, make people zoos for their favorite humans and, um, take over the world and overcome mankind or whatnot. So when I was in Phoenix last time with my sister, she's like, sister, you got to try this. You got to, um, you got to, uh, ask Siri all these questions about, working for the CIA and the FBI and all this other stuff. And she's supposed to be evasive and she's supposed to, um, end up, you know, just powering off. Um, so I tried that not really wanting to, um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting to say the least. So I'm kind of worried about doing this Siri 3am challenge because I'm already worried that I pissed off Siri and when the end of the world comes, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know. 
I might not make it into one of those people zoos, which might be for the better. Um, they might just kill me off, but, um, yeah, AI really does scare me. I don't know why. But anywho, um, so my daughter, she ended up going to bed early tonight, but when we went to Farmington yesterday to go shopping for Christmas, um, she was telling me that Mommy E had returned. And I'm not sure, I'm sure I've told this story, but just in case I haven't, here it goes again. So, back when we lived in an A-frame in Tween Lakes, um, Kinsey had the room upstairs to the left. We had the room upstairs to the right. The bottom portion of the A-frame was a living room and a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, her room was always so cold, like, uh, even during the summer. But during the winter, you'd pull up and you could see the beams, you know, going down and the beams going between the rooms but her room was always covered in snow. All the rest of the rooms, you could see that they had melted the snow off. Um, she would often ask for us to turn off the, the lights, turn off the um, night lights, close the door, and to be quiet. And when we, uh, we kind of laugh about it and think it was strange, like, why are you wanting the lights off? Like, that's so unusual for a two-year-old to be asking, well, she's at this point three, to be asking for the lights to be off, for all lights to be off, for us to be quiet, and for the door to be closed. And she finally told us that in the house, in her room in particularly, were these two ghosts. One was called Baby E, and the other one was called Mommy E. And we asked her, well, why are they called that? Well, because they make this e noise. Well, that was creepy. Um, so, we had different incidences. She would tell us about Mommy E reaching over her bed to grab her. Um, often yell at us to be quiet because Mommy E was getting upset. Uh, we ended up moving her down to the living room because all these things that were happening were just really creeping us out. One night we're laying in bed and we hear the doorknob going off back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All of a sudden it goes all the way around, opens the door and you can hear it release the doorknob and the door just kind of creaks open. Um, so I'm thinking it's Kinsey. I'm like, Kinsey, you're supposed to be in bed. What are you doing out of bed? Come in the room so I can see you. Um, so... Let's see. Renee's asking, so where's the after party on Facebook? Um, I'll, I'll try to pull it up on Facebook on one co computer and the other computer I'll do Skype and then I'll be using my phone to contact Siri. Um, so I open the door. Kinsey's not there. I run down the stairs and there she is on the couch asleep. She'd been asleep. You didn't hear her run down the stairs. All you heard was this doorknob going back and forth, back and forth, and then it finally releasing the doorknob and the door creaking open. Um, so that was really weird. Um, we asked her about Mommy E and Baby E. What was the story behind these two entities? Well, Baby E died while climbing a tree. So Mommy E was sad and died to go be with Baby E. And when we asked her what Mommy E looked like, she said, well, she looked like she had been in the bathtub for too long. And Mommy E died to go be with Baby E because she missed Baby E so much. Well, that was just creepy. Like, this description from a two- or three-year-old of this lady with this wrinkly skin um, and dirty blonde hair that had been um, in the water too long. Like, her skin looked wrinkly, her hands, her face, uh, from being in the water too long. Okay, so now Kinsey's 19 years old. So this is 16 years later, and she has blocked out most of these experiences for her own protection and her own, you know, survival. Just that thing that a lot of us do when we go through something traumatic, we'll block it out in our heads um, so it doesn't hurt or traumatize us any longer. Um, well, she tells me the other day, <laughs> Moonlight, 
baby E is wrinkly. Not baby E, mommy E. She's the one that was in the bathtub too long. Well, Kinsey tells me the other day as we're driving to Farmington, New Mexico, mom, mommy E is back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's back, mom. She said, I had a dream the other night and Timmy woke me up and it took him a while to wake me up. But when I woke up, like I was crying so profusely, like tears were running down my face and I was just shaking and trembling. I could not believe what had just happened and what I had just seen. And I was like, well, what happened? Mom, I was in the bathtub and mommy E came in. And she said, I totally forgot what she looked like until I saw her. And then I knew exactly who she was. Mommy E came in and tried to drown me in the bathtub. And in my dream, I'm fighting and fighting and fighting and trying to get away from Mommy E. And she said, I'm holding on and grabbing onto her arms and, and stuff, trying to get her off of me. And she said, her skin was wrinkly. Her skin was wrinkly like she had been in the bathtub too long. And her hair was dirty blonde and it kind of had that flowing motion like she was still underwater, but she wasn't. Um, and just uh, her face was long and narrow, she said. Um, and everywhere on her body looked like she had been in the bathtub for too long. That was so creepy. Like, why all of a sudden is Mommy E coming back? And um, And that's what she's wondering too. And we're actually wondering... How did she go from being in Tween Lakes, right outside of Durango, to being um, in Ignacio, Colorado, in this new house she lives in? And this new house she lives in, she was so excited when she got it. Mom, it's so pretty. you got to come see it. And it took me a while to get over there to go see it. But um, it's not bad. You can tell it's really old. The floors underneath the carpet is creaky and such. Um, the, the ceilings are tall and vaulted and, um, I think it's a two bedroom, one bath. There's a kitchen, kind of like a pantry area. And then there's a large like living room area, all the ceilings being vaulted. And she said, this was an old Catholic church before they turned it into a house. Um, and then let's see. Oh, before mommy E came back different things started happening. Well, when I first came to check out her house, I'm like, this house is so haunted. And she's like, oh, well, we haven't really experienced anything. Like, sometimes I feel like something's there, but, um, you know, nothing that's been trying to scare us or anything like that. Um, I was like, it's totally haunted. It'll be a matter of time and stuff is going to start happening. And it has. Things have started happening. Um, at first it was just Kinsey and Timmy. Now they have a roommate, which is one of Timmy's old friends. And, um, I guess it first started off with Kinsey laying in bed and, um, all of a sudden she hears their roommate screaming like he's being attacked, like thrashing around, screaming for help. Um, and she's trying to wake up her boyfriend, which is virtually impossible to wake up. Like basically when he goes to sleep, he's in a coma. He doesn't hear nothing, doesn't feel nothing. Um, he's dead to the world. So she runs in there to try to save this roommate. I think his name is Drew, if I remember correctly. Um, and he's asleep. He's fine. Nothing's happening. Um, you go back into the bedroom, and then she hears it happening again. He's screaming, fighting something. Something's attacking him. She runs out to check on him, and there he is again, just sleeping. Nothing's happening. He's fine. Nobody's attacking him, and she's wondering what the hell is happening. Um, just this last week, right before she had her mommy E dream, um, she hears this chainsaw being started outside her bedroom window and she's asking Timmy, like, don't you hear that? Don't you hear that chainsaw outside the window? And he's like, I don't hear anything. And I don't know what you're talking about. Um, they go out to check it out. Nothing out there. No chainsaw running. Nothing. Um, go back in. He goes to sleep. And it's out there again, chainsaw being turned on. And then it's just like running right outside her bedroom. Um, so she said she was up all night that night. Um, she was up all night the night that she had the dream of mommy E again, which is interesting. Like how, if maybe it's because a portal or some sort of vortex exists in this house 
I know Ignacio is a, um, basically reservation land, um, Ute land, and so there's all kinds of things going on out there. There's a family of natives that um, had called me and want me to go out there and hear her mother tell these stories to me, and maybe perhaps we can investigate. Um, but it's hard to get out there with this new job, and you know, um, all of our our team members all have muggle jobs, and so. Um, it's hard for us to really get away and do the things that we'd like to do. And I so want to go out there. And, and I was like, would she be willing to be on the show? Or can I record this and play it on the show? Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be interesting when I f can finally get out there. And I'm definitely going to record it and play it back for you guys. Um, because the this family's been there for well over 20 years. And a lot of their family won't even come out to see them because the activity is so crazy and so immense. Um, to them, it's just normal because they've lived with it all their lives. But to their family members that used to come visit, that don't come visit anymore, it's not normal. And they can't even see how these people live there. But they've just kind of grown accustomed to um, to all this activity. Um, well, we're going to go to break here in a little bit. Um, I forgot to tell you guys about Mommy E, one of the most aggressive things that she did. Uh, Kinsey was upstairs. We're downstairs watching a movie. And Mommy E pushed Kinsey so hard to the point where she flew down the stairs right in front of us doing cartwheels in the air and slammed at the bottom of the stairs and we took her to the ER. And she was fine. But that was our last straw. That was basically um, right before we moved out. But on that note... We're going to go to our second break. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after these messages. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. 
You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From radio commercials to banners and social media, have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Hi there, this is Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and I want you to come on a nightly journey. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, every Monday through Friday, you can come hang out with me and the other space travelers. We have it all from Carl the Alien bouncing on by to those misfit gnomes causing havoc. It's three hours of fun and entertainment on those topics the mainstream really doesn't want to touch. Come get all paranormal with us at spacedoutradio.com. And together, my friends, along with our resident guitar god, Bumblefoot, we own the night. Sit back, relax, grab a drink, and listen closely. Spaced Out Radio continues through the weekend. From the mile-high mountains of Colorado to you, listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Weekend with Tessa Nicole Thomas. Hey guys, welcome back and thanks so much for coming out and listening to ghost stories with me and um to all of my listeners out there in the universe wherever you may be um if you'd like to call in with your ghost stories i'd really love to hear them and i'm sure uh the rest of our listeners would love to hear them as well and just to give you uh that phone number once more the number is 970-335-9596 that's 970-335-9596. And uh, Rano actually called me, and I was talking to him, but I don't know if he couldn't hear me or if he accidentally pocket-dialed me or what. But um, that was pretty interesting. 
So I'm looking at more stories here. My second computer is um, acting up, but luckily I have my handy dandy cell phone uh, where I can look up stories there. So, um, passing over this story because I have read this story to you guys before. Um, but we're going to move on to some other stories. One of the stories that my friend uh, had shared with me um, back in the day, we were actually on a temple trip in Manti, Utah, and she was telling us about how she was driving out to go visit some of her family, and um, during this trip, she encountered this old lady on the side of the road, and Sherwin just shared a story like this with me as well. But this lady's wearing the old Navajo um, dress as far as it's kind of like a button-up, really nice uh, shirt on the top and a nice uh, long skirt on the bottom with intricate designs on it and wearing, um, they either wear these coral necklaces or turquoise necklaces. Sometimes they're orange, sometimes they're turquoise colored. Um, but anyways, her and her friend are in this car and they see this old lady on the side of the road. And they're like, holy crap, this is not normal. Like, what's going on? And um, so at first they see her, and she's just walking alongside the road. And they pass her by. They're not stopping because it's the middle of the night, and it's just creepy, and they know all these skinwalker stories and things that have happened to not only them but uh, friends of theirs. So they see this lady uh, further up along the road, and this time she's actually limping and um they're like wow how did this lady get all the way up here from where she was before and now she's limping they pass her by keep driving down this gravel road and then all of a sudden they see her again and this time like she's really struggling to walk she's kind of somewhat dragging her leg and and you know waving at them to pull over and they're like hell no, we're not stopping. There's no way we're stopping for this lady because there's nothing right about this situation. Like, how could this lady keep being in front of us when we've passed her by like three or four times already? Um, then all of a sudden the lady appears right in the middle of the road in front of them. And, you know, she screeches to a stop and backs up and turns around and goes back the way she came. And she ended up not going to visit her family till the very next day. But that was one of the first Skinwalker stories that I'd ever, ever um, heard from anyone that I had known. And it had really freaked me out. And um, when we'd go and camp up at Mesa Verde and stuff, I, I've always had trouble sleeping. But especially up there, I was just like, I cannot sleep. Like, maybe I'd get two or three hours of sleep per night, maybe. Um, just hearing all these noises out in the trees and stuff. And it's most likely mule deer or whatnot, um, well, going along with the whole being LDS and such, our family has always been one to sign up for feeding the elders, um, during the week because, you know, they only have so much money for their mission and they're not supplied everything that they really should have. Um, one night they come and they're all really, really freaked out and they're like, you're never going to believe what we just encountered today. It was the freakiest thing that ever happened, and you're you're not going to believe us. You're going to think we're crazy, and we're like, go ahead, tell us what happened. Well, they had been driving around Shiprock, um, not Shiprock, Toyok, um, not far from where I lived when I saw the skinwalkers outside of my house, and they end up going up this road. Well, this road starts to lead them up onto Sleeping Ute Mountain, which actually looks like a native man sleeping with his arms crossed uh, over his chest. And, um, so they're going up this road, they see this fire in the distance, and all of a sudden they see this pack of wolf-looking coyote dogs. And, um, all of a sudden they're surrounding the van that they're in, and they're hitting it and punching it, standing on their back hind legs, trying to get into this vehicle, and these guys are freaking out trying to figure out a way to turn around because it's basically a narrow road and they finally come to a larger part of the road and they're able to turn around and get the hell out of there. And, um, when they get to our house, we go out and look and there are huge 
like fist marks in the side of their van. There's marks where like you could see the clawed fingers like dug into the side of the van. It was really freaky. I'm, I'm glad that they made it out, but that was really, really interesting and um, really quite freaky. And I've never, you know, I've been interested in going up on Sleeping Ute, but I won't even during the day go up there because I know to them it's sacred land and it's somewhere that I should not be going. Although my curiosity is peaked and I want to go and check it out, um, there's no way I'm going up there. No way in Sam's hell. So this one's called Stay Away from the Ruins of the Inquisition. And it begins here. This all happened about five years ago. One night, a few of my friends decided after a night of hanging out that we'd go on an adventure at about 3 a.m. We took a ride about 50 miles to this old Spanish ruin in New Mexico that was once the seat of the Inquisition. I can't for the life of me remember what the place is called. So I jumped the front gate to the place and start exploring. One of my friends brought a flute with him, and he started playing it, and about 30 seconds into this mediocre playing, something started screaming really, really loud on the tops of the long, destroying walls of the place. It was going from wall to wall really quick, screaming the most blood-curdling scream you've ever, ever imagined. We nope. <laughs> we noped the F out of there. One of my friends peed his pants and drove for a few hours to, what is it called, Bandelier National Monument, where we planned to camp out for the rest of the weekend. We got to Bandelier at probably like 6 or 7 a.m. and set up our camp. After a few hours just talking about what the hell happened at the ruins, I went to <laughs> to take a piss behind probably only like 300 feet from our camp. This is where everything starts getting a little fuzzy. I remember seeing two dust devils coming my way, and when I turned around again, two of my friends were there, and they were motioning me to follow them. I couldn't help but to follow them, like I was being pulled behind them in shackles. I followed them for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes, and then I snapped out of it. These weren't my friends. They had bright red hair with my friends' faces and cat eyes. Both of these friends were brunette. I stopped walking, and they looked at me with probably the, the most terrifying gaze I've ever seen. Monsters in movies are nothing compared to this. I turned around and ran as fast as I could back the way I came from. After like five minutes of a full sprint, I got back to the rock, and I pissed at the end of... at the, What does it say? That I pissed at, at and found our camp. Everyone was there, still sitting around talking, and didn't even notice that I was gone. I told them what happened with the look-alike skinwalkers, and we packed up everything and left probably within like 10 minutes and got the hell back to Albuquerque. So that was interesting. I've heard a couple stories like that. Uh, one where they were camping, and um, the guy gets up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and... All of a sudden, he sees his friend, and his friend, um, actually, he hears his friend calling for help, and he starts towards the voice slowly, you know, because it's dark, and he can hardly see anything, but he starts walking towards him, and um, all of a sudden, he feels something on his shoulder, like a hand on his shoulder, and he turns around, and it it's his friend, and his friend is like, shh, that's not me, let's, let's go back, and so they went back, and um, so that was pretty terrifying. But yeah, um, if you guys would like to call in with your stories, I'll give you the number again, 970-335-9596, 970-335-9596, um, and I was trying to put that in the chat room here, but I was not quite in the right place. Wow, the heck, what the crack? Okay, let me try that again. 970-335-9596 if you guys would like to call in with your ghost stories. Um, but we'll continue on with this one, which is called Tap Tap at the Window. I was a kid when this happened. My uncle and my, uh, my uncle and I were finishing up chopping, gathering firewood for my grandfather because it was getting dark. 
Driving back on a dirt road at about 30 miles per hour, give or take 5 miles per hour, I had this awful sense of being watched. Before I could turn to look out my window, passenger side, my uncle quickly shouted, Don't! I completely froze. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest, then completely stopped when I heard a tap-tap on my window. My uncle sped up and was loudly praying in my native language. I didn't know what was going on and thought it was all it was over till our truck suddenly dipped from the bed. My uncle then started saying, look at me and don't turn away over and over. Then I heard it again, tap, tap. But from the window behind me, it was getting harder for me to breathe and I wanted to cry. A minute or two passed and the truck dipped again. My uncle looked around and sighed. It was, it was quiet besides the truck and the road. He looked at me and said, we will ask your father to do a prayer in the morning so the evil will forget our faces. Nav- no, that's basically Navajo to English equivalent to as to what he said. Um, I remember curling up on the seat and just staring at the radio, watching the time, listening to my uncle sing an old prayer till we got to my grandfather's house. I called my uncle because I had a nightmare about that night. We talked about it for a bit. He said, I didn't see faces, just eyes, like brake lights you see on the road. It watched you. And that was the basic Navajo to English equivalent of what he was saying. Before hanging up, I tried joking with him about it. Why didn't you just step on the brake when it was in the back? No laughter, just a pause, because it wasn't alone. Ew. This one's called convinced I saw a skinwalker. As many of you might already know, many Navajo people, including my own family, are very reluctant to speak about skinwalkers because it's believed to attract their attention. While I, however, grew up away from the Navajo Nation and was very naive about the subject, when it came to skinwalkers, I was an absolute skeptic. My mom used to tell a story how back in the 80s when she lived with her siblings and my grandparents, still in Shiprock, but the southern outskirts, about how she and my aunt saw a skinwalker just outside their driveway under a streetlight. She described it as a black dog with dirty fur, a twisted, noddle-like front leg, and these unnatural eyes with soft, burnt orange glow. Me being my own closed-minded self doubted every word, but I never said my doubts aloud. But these doubts totally changed last year when I went to my grandparents' house last October. Me and my family had just finished scourging the carnival at the Navajo Nation Fair and called it a night. The house was close enough where we could walk home in just 10 minutes, so we did. When we got there, it was about 9 at night where we stayed up until about 2, catching up about family affairs and the local news. It was during that time that I just decidedly opened my mouth and blurred out the question, Hey, are skinwalkers real? Guys, I asked. You shouldn't be speaking about that, my grandma said with almost a disturbed yell in her voice. So she and my grandfather both decide to go to bed. After being scolded by my mom, one of my aunt chimes in with a very cautious tone and says, they're real, all right, but if you start screaming outside of my trailer in Farmington just a few nights ago, your cousin had nightmares the whole night and woke up crying that morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not wanting to push the di- discomfort any further, we all decided to go to bed. Now the trailer slash home is pretty old, and it was a really nice night, so we slept with the windows open with screens to prevent bugs coming in. Everyone had drifted off to sleep except me, because my mind was still going a million miles a minute about skinwalkers and wondering if I ever encountered one while here on the reservation. As a kid, I was told it's taboo to think about skinwalkers because it can still call their attention. That's when Ish totally hit the fan. Just as I was settling and finally getting relaxed for sleep, I started to hear something moving outside. I get up from the couch and start wandering over to the kitchen window. In the trailer, all of the rooms have lights out, so the only visible light that can be seen is from the porch light out front. I was thankful for this because I told myself, if it really was a skinwalker outside, then hopefully it wouldn't notice me seeing it. 
so I muster up the courage and take a quick scan of outside. From the porch light, all I can see is the dusty ground and the vehicles that my family drove along with some old metal trash cans that stood beside the road. Looking for about a good five seconds, I wasn't able to see anything, so I was getting ready to turn around and walk back to bed, thinking it was just a stray cat or something. Only have taken two steps, I hear what sound like a distorted scream coming from outside. Definitely close by. Fear rising, I look outside again, and there I see it. A coyote-like figure was staring at my direction, from behind the cars, just outside of the reach of the porch light. That's weird, that happened to me too. Only it looked awfully wrong and gave off an evil vibe just from seeing it. It was gray with very disheveled hair and a horrific orange-red soft glow that came from its eyes. I noped the hell out and ran back to the bedroom. It was at this moment I had began to also notice an awful stench in the air that smelled like rotten meat. I started trying to wake up my mom, who was like, Oh my God, it's almost 3 a.m. What do you want? I immediately began in a shaken voice. There's something scary outside. Then she said, now annoyed because I woke her up. Ugh, it's probably just a stray animal or something. It's the res. Animals wander all the time at night. She obviously wasn't getting the drift of what I was saying, so I screamed. There's some Blair Witch Project-ish going on outside, Ma. <laughs> that got her attention. What? What the hell are you talking about, she said. Then we heard it. The thing outside started making more of its dreadful like screams and started what sounding like thrashing outside on the ground. Hear that? That's what I'm talking about. So both her and I go back out looking outside the window and the coyote thing was making its way to the door. It walked with an odd limp and dragged its back right leg as if it was handicapped. See, that's a good trick they like to use, even in animal form. We could hear it start to scratch against the door and make this odd muffled moaning sound. My mom went and got my dad and they both started shouting in Navajo all sorts of words telling the thing to go away and saying it's not welcome here. Well, all this commotion was enough to get the rest of the trailer up as they came out into the hallway. The only thing my mom did was turn to them and said, Skinwalker, while proceeding to point to the door, noises still happening. Apparently, they already knew exactly what to do as my grandfather got out a handgun from a drawer and a bag of ashes. He coated a few bullets and loaded them into the gun and went straight to the door, yelling out more Navajo that was too fast for me to comprehend. He swung open the door and fired twice. Nothing. The thing managed to escape before my grandpa could put a bullet in it. That's the fastest one I've ever seen, said my grandpa. Next thing you know, my aunts and my parents are freaked out about what just happened, saying stuff like, What if it comes back tomorrow and it saw us? Does that mean we're targets now? Afterwards, my grandparents calmed everyone down, myself included, saying, We'll be fine, and we all went to bed around three-ish. Morning comes, and my grandparents call one of their neighbors and explain to them what happened. Apparently, one of them was a medicine man who used to partake in yaibi cheese. Navajo ceremonies used for healing and curing sickness and came over to bless each family member and the grounds outside. It's pretty interesting. And, you know, you guys, I've been looking for people to come on the show and um, share some native lore and their stories about skinwalkers and such. And one of the girls I talked to, I'd actually gone to high school with and and she's like, good luck finding somebody to come on and talk about this. Because like they've often said, um, and like they said in these stories, you don't talk about it because then it draws the negativity towards you. Whether it be skinwalkers or something else that's out there. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And it's kind of um, hard for me to wrap my mind around because... I feel the more I talk about stuff, the better it makes me feel, and um, the more I get that trauma off of me, um, but for them, they don't even like to talk about the dead because they feel like um, even saying the name of the dead will keep them from resting in peace, so they don't even talk about, um, they don't even talk about their dead. 
So this one is called, It Nearly Got Him and His Brother. This is my father's story written from his perspective. When I was about 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone, a lot like our house now. It was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the Yamez Fest and left us to tend the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs going crazy outside. Thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance, we told them to be quiet. We be uh, began to drift off into sleep, and the dogs would not shut up. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house, save for my brother snoring and breathing. I realized I needed to use the outhouse and woke up my brother to take me there. He teased me about being scared, which I certainly was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs began with their craze barking out in the sagebrush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first, and I waited outside for him while waiting. I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Suddenly, there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Then everything went quiet again. It was really too quiet for that time of year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I f heard a few of the dogs going completely mad by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man. He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little and then suddenly kicked one of them. They all scattered in different directions. The thing looked up at me and I saw its face. It had a pure white face, like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began to walk toward me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was a dark red, like the color of blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. It kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of the outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed this thing's long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash, and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move toward my brother, finally noticing this figure... My brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out toward my brother's head. Something finally snapped in me. I became unbearably angry. I broke from the, the trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became more and more uh, angrier at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had, I became I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull, its smile now long since gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the feast. After relaying the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man. And a lot of times that's what it takes, you know, for these people. And I've had people with cases where, you know, native bones have been dug up on their land because they sold rights to the oil company. And so they're putting these oil rigs and these guys dig up the bones and they don't even rebury them. They just leave them laying and they don't even call in medicine men to come and bless the land or the family that is being affected and my daughter, um, my oldest daughter, my 19 year old had a friend that lived on a property like this and it's a very beautiful property and it's got an amazing, beautiful view of the La Plata mountains and just open, open land and some pretty trees here and there. And you know, the view of the mountains and everything, but after the oil company came in and dug these bones up, then, um, this girl, which was a friend of my daughter, started hearing voices, different random voices telling her to do different things, um, do bad things, telling her to do things to hurt herself or hurt other people around her. So, um, it's pretty interesting yet sad at the same time because there's so many of these oil rigs being set up 
and not very many medicine men uh, to be able to come out and help to bless and, you know, rebury and do the rituals that they need for these people so they're not at peace and then they're wreaking havoc on the family. Um, I don't remember if I told you guys this story or not, but in my quest to find um, Navajos or Utes to talk about native lore, I went to the casino one night. Um, I, I believe this was a night that uh, my friend Glow had got me a room and um, she's a, a big player at the casino, but she doesn't like staying there. Neither does my husband. He said the air is too dry, um, but I really quite enjoy it. Um, but I'm walking around and visiting with this lady I had met. And then I decide to go to this circle bar where they are, um, serving free drinks, basically. I mean, you can t tip them and, um, get a better drink and none of them are alcoholic unless you go to the bar, but it was so late. Like there was no way the bar was open. Um, so I go to the circle bar and I sit next to this, uh, this beautiful Ute girl and I'm telling her what I do for Corners Paranormal Investigations and telling her about these lands and these bodies that are being dug up and, um, does she know anything as far as how to appease these spirits that have been dug up and are not at peace and they're just wreaking havoc on this poor girl that lives on this property and... Um, she's like, well, let me think. Well, when I was a girl, we had spirits on our property as well. And in order to appease these spirits, my mom would put fruits and breads and these different items of food on a plate. And then she'd go and set it outside by the certain tree. And that was her offering to the spirits. Um, she said she'd sit there in the window and she'd just stare out there waiting for a spirit or something to happen, something to come up and grab the fruit or grab the food and take it and eat it. She said the animals would not mess with it. No birds, uh, no coyotes, no raccoons, no skunks, nothing like that would come up and mess with it. And uh, about a week later, she's telling her mom, mom, these spirits, they're not, they're not going and eating the food. The food is still there. And she said, daughter, they they don't consume the food like you and I. They consume the essence of the food. And so her being told that, she goes out and she takes a piece of the fruit and takes a bite out of it. No taste whatsoever. That's weird. So she picks up a piece of the bread, takes a bite of that. No taste whatsoever. Um, she's trying these different different pieces of food and she's realizing what her mother was saying. It doesn't eat the food. It takes the essence of the food and it does accept it as a peace offering. And it does cause things to calm down on the property. But it's interesting little things like that, um, that a lot of us don't think about when we, we try to help people. You know, there's always the white sage and the Palo Santo and, um, elderberries and, um, blessed cedar and all these other things that you may use to, um, basically get rid of these spirits, hopefully. And, um, and so that was interesting. Like I hadn't heard that before. I've heard of putting things out. Um, if you let certain fruit out and you just leave it to waste, like that can attract negative spirits that do come and feed off of it because you're just leaving it out there as somewhat of an offering, even though you're not intentionally doing it as an offering, that's what they're seeing. <clears throat> And Ryan's telling these awesome stories in the chat room, and I wish you'd call in and, and share them online so the rest of our listeners can hear them. Um, but our number for that, and I'll put it in the chat room again, 970-335-9596. Sorry, guys, my storyboard just fell as far as my intro and my outro. Picking it back up. Um, but yeah, there's so many interesting stories that I've heard about these different things, and I, you know... I might seem a little obsessed with the skinwalkers and the spirits in this area, but it's the area that I've grown up in since fourth grade. You know, I've grown up with the Navajo friends, Ute friends, um, a whole plethora of different varieties of friends and, um, learning all these different religions and ways of life and, you know, as you get to know certain people, you're able to trust each other and share your ghost stories. And so 
I've been um, able to learn so many different things from them, and I'm, you know, often surprised. I can never say that I'm never surprised when I go on an, an investigation because every story is different. Um, so yeah, I finally got a plethora out there for all my friends in the chat room. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. <laughs> um, and I got a plethora more of stories here to read as well. So there you go. Three drinkies for all my peeps. My peeps and perps out there. Um, so this one is called An Attack on a Party Van. Whenever my mom would take us on a road trip to her hometown on the reservation, Navajo reservation, I'd occasionally ask her to tell me a skinwalker story along the way. I remember every story she's told me was when we were driving through miles of nothing at night. Luckily, nothing ever happened to us during those drives. Anyways, this is one of those stories, and it came from my auntie. So my auntie and some of her friends used to party a lot back in the day. They'd hop in a beaten down van, drive out to the boondocks, and just drink and have fun. Of course, this all took place on the Navajo reservation. After sunset, on this particular night, that's what they were doing. Everything was going good and whatnot, when all of a sudden they hear what sounds like rocks being thrown at their van. Everyone gets quiet as they wonder what the hell is going on. The sounds of rocks being thrown stops and then suddenly something jumps on top of the van roof. I should mention my family owned a white van that we would use for road trips because it had enough room for all my brothers and me. So imagine young me being told the story in a van. Terrifying! Everyone starts panicking as they the realization sets in and hurry to lock all the doors. My auntie jumps in the driver's seat and tries to start the engine. Of course, the beaten down van then refuses to start. Whatever is on the roof is still up there making banging noises at this point like it's jumping up and down. My auntie is freaking out when she then sees a hand with long nails each over the roof and start scratching the windshield. At this point in the story, my mom would take one hand off the steering wheel and scratch the windshield to simulate it. Then, whatever was on the roof jumps off. Everyone is still freaking out, yelling at my auntie to start the van, and she keeps trying. That's when she sees the skinwalker walk up to the driver's side window and stare at her just a few inches away. Well, that's when my auntie jumped into the back and started praying for her life. Minutes pass, and the skinwalker appears to leave. My auntie hops back in the driver's seat and gets the van to start, and off they go. This next one is called Say Their Name and It Will Kill Them. And my daughter, um, the one that was telling me about Mommy E and Baby E and about her friend that saw the skinwalker and such just recently, um, she's like, you're not supposed to say their name. And I was like, skinwalker, 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 you know? Because <laughs> I I've lived in this area for so long and I've talked about skinwalkers several times and they don't appear to me as much as I'd like them to. Oh, we got a caller. Let me unmute you. Hello, Mr. Mooney. How are you this evening? Lovely, How are you doing? Good. It's so great to hear from you. I'm so glad you called in. Loving everything tonight. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, it's been a good evening. Last night was quite different. We had a few F-bombs going off there. Had to duck and roll and take cover. But uh, all in all, it was a pretty epic show last night. I really enjoyed it. But I'm so glad you called in. Awesome. I'd love to hear it. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and get it together. See if I can read it right. Okay. You can do it. <laughs> Am I loud enough for you? Um, yeah, I went ahead and turned you up a little bit because you were a little quiet, but I cranked you up all the way, baby. Okay, well, let me go. T'was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring except that damn mouse. He chewed through the cable line. He whizzed on my phone. Thank God for good weed. The kids are both home. 
and since they are high as crap, they'll leave us alone. Well, the mother-in-law's meds have finally kicked in. She fell over the chair and passed out on Jim. My wife is just dressed into her outfit that arrived in the mail. It's guaranteed sexy, so you know that can't fail. So as we prepare to get all funky and such, it scared us so bad, it scared us so much. Up on the roof, then down through the wall, then things got real serious when it rang down the hall. I peeped over the railing to the room down below, and through the smoky mist, I saw a dark figure and shouted, Hello! Well, the creature looked lively and turned to the right. Okay, well, let me fix that. Um, give me a second here. Do you want me to start over or just pick up where I left off? I cranked you up all the way, but yeah, let's see what you can do on your end, and we'll see if that works and everybody can hear you. I'm loving the story so far, though, I must say. <laughs> I can hear the background noise better for a second there. I love it. A Christmas story. I'm so excited. And while we're waiting for this, you guys, uh, during the after party, we're going to be doing the 3 a.m. Um, Siri challenge, and we're going to see what happens. I've seen some... Can you say that again? Is it any better yet? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Okay, that's much better? Yes. Okay. Well, let me give this another shot then, okay? All right, looking forward to it. And go. <laughs> Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring except for that damn mouse. He had chewed through the cable line. He had whizzed on my phone. Thank God for good weed. The kids are both home. And since they were high as crap, they'll leave us alone. Well, the mother-in-law's meds have finally kicked in. She fell over the chair, and he passed out on gin. My wife had just dressed in her outfit that arrived in the mail. It's guaranteed sexy, so you know that can't fail. So as we prepared to get all funky and such, we heard such a clatter it scared us so much. Up on the roof, then down through the wall, then things got real serious when it rang down the hall. I peeped over the railing to the room down below, and through the smoky mist, I saw a dark figure and shouted, Hello! Well, the creature looked lively and turned to the right. It then shifted upwards and caught me in its sight. It was a big man of sorts with a pipe and a hat. And out of the bag, he pulled out a bat. He paced, placed it below the Christmas tree, so tender. I could see it had a bow and a tag from sender. Oh, my goodness. Oh, what a splendor. A gift for me or maybe my son. I thought either way, one of us had won. So I stood there and watched. He was such a wonder. Gift after gift, without a single blunder. As I looked at the sack to see what was left, it was totally flat, not a bump or a lump. The odd man was leaving, so I pulled out my gun. I said, look, you fat freak, let's both have some fun. If you can summon a demon, you can have my soul. He paused and just stared for a more moment or two. Then he placed his finger aside his nose, and he blew and blew. The room grew windy. A glowing green mist appeared. I started to realize this is going to be worse than I feared. So I cocked the revolver and pulled back the trigger. As the bullet flew out, I heard him give a shout. Look behind you, dear boy. Your soul, it is mine. But before I could turn, I felt that cold burn of the breath of the beast on my neck. So this time of year, I am busy as heck. Just pulling this wreck as reindeer number five. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, y'all.
Heck yes. Merry Christmas. And thank you so much. That was awesome. I loved it. Are you still there? I think he hung up. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks so much, Mr. Kevin, a.k.a. Mooney, for, um, for coming in and telling that story. And I see Renee saying she's going to try to call in. And that would be freaking amazing. I haven't been able to hear her voice yet. And I love when you guys call in, whether it's during the show or during the after party, SOR Asylum after party, because it does make me feel that much more closer to you. I feel more of a connection. And, um, and especially when I see people on the Skype after party, I'm like, holy shnikes. Like I see you, I can see you. Um, it's pretty cool. We always have a good time on there. But yeah, Renee, go ahead and uh, try to call in. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your story or whatever you'd like to share with us. Um, and one of the things I shared on um, Twitter is a picture, um, and it was pretty awesome, like, as far as when, let's see, when I had heard this song in the past, I don't remember hearing these particular lyrics, um, but here, let's, let's pull it up here real quick, lack, um, and it's, it's a common song that's done during Christmas. And um, it's called, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, which is one of um, the best Christmas songs out there. But one of the lyrics goes, There will be parties for hosting, marshmallows for roasting, and caroling out in the snow. There will be scary ghost stories and tales of glories of the Christmases long, long ago. And I don't... <clears throat> excuse me, I don't remember ever hearing that part about ghost stories. Like you would think that would really stand out to me. Um, and Rano, I have not got to go to the post office yet. My husband lost the mailbox key and we reordered some. So we're going tomorrow morning and I'll be able to check the mail then. And I'm so excited, um, to get, get that Christmas card from you. I'm so excited. I haven't, uh, gotten anything from any of my guests yet so far. So that, that'll that definitely go up on my wall. And I'll be showing it off next weekend for sure. I wish I could have gotten there sooner. So I could have showed it off today. Uh, during my Facebook Live. And um, that would have been awesome. And Rano, I know you try to call me on, on Skype. And I picked up and I could hear background noise. But I couldn't hear you. And I don't know if you could hear me. But um, I know you called. And I was like, call back in. I'll take your call. And I even tried calling you back, but you didn't answer. That being said, we have 10 minutes before we're kicking off the show and going off to the SOR Asylum after party. Um, but here the next uh, story is called Say Their Name and It Will Kill Them. And yeah, my daughter was saying that the other day. You're not supposed to say the name, the S word. And, um, on this show, it means an entirely different thing, but I'm like, skinwalker, skinwalker, skinwalker. And every time she talk, talk about it, I'd say it three times. Um, nothing happened, of course, but, uh, it was pretty funny to see her reaction. She took it very seriously because her mute friend had told her, you're not supposed to say that word because it'll track them. But here goes, we live in a rural community on the Navajo reservation, my aunt and her two brothers were home alone while my grandparents had left for the evening to attend a chapter house meeting. They were in the house and like many people from the reservation, they didn't have electricity. It had been dark outside for about an hour and my aunt and my uncles were getting ready for bed. Outside they heard noises as if someone moving things around outside. My oldest uncle went to look out the front window and saw a figure out by the truck. This was immensely out of the ordinary because the closest neighbor was miles away. Whatever it was opened the truck door and began to dig through the personal items that my family had left in the vehicle. My aunt and uncles were frightened by the sight and knew that they should take action. They took out the rifle and all steadied themselves to hold it up. They flung open the door. It sounds like that's a pretty big rifle. <laughs> oh, it's not going to work, Ernie. Dang it. Oh, I wonder, hmm, I wonder if, 
I'm wondering if you could Facebook call, but I'm not sure if that would work. My aunt and uncles were frightened by the sight. Okay, so they're opening the door, flung it open, aimed the gun at the dark figure, and the figure turned and started to walk towards them. Totally unfazed by the weapon, my uncle pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The figure drew closer, and my aunt began to smell something like a rotting corpse. It was so strong it made her gag. My uncle continued to pull the trigger with no luck, and the figure came closer and closer. Off in the distance, headlights were coming up the road. My grandparents were returning. The figure looked towards the lights and started to move away and tucked itself behind a tree near the house. My oldest uncle ran toward the truck with the gun. My grandfather got out of the car and my uncle pointed to the tree. The thing was poking out its head to observe what they were doing. My grandfather ran into the house and over to the stove and grabbed a handful of ashes and rubbed it over the gun and placed an ash-covered bullet into the chamber. So I'm wondering what this whole ash thing is about. I'm going to have to figure it out. It's pretty interesting because this is the first I've heard of it. We walked out onto the porch and fired toward the tree. Whatever that thing was didn't expect the gun to go off. The gunshot echoed, and the dark figure began running. My grandma chased my aunt inside, and my uncles and my grandfather went after it. There weren't many roads or paths, so as my grandfather and uncles chased after the figure, the truck was bouncing, and the headlights were not fixed on one particular spot. My uncle swears that when even the headlights would hit the figure, he saw a woman. Not only that, whoever it was running on all fours like a bear. My grandfather eventually stopped the truck, and as they neared the ditch that drops about 20 feet, he got out and began to yell in Navajo. My uncle says that he was yelling about a local woman. He yelled that he wasn't scared and that he knew it was her and to leave his family alone. A few days passed, and there was news that the woman that my grandfather was yelling about had passed. I've always been told that if you know the skinwalker is, say their name and it will kill them. Um, and I've actually heard that about a couple of things, um, but mostly skinwalkers. <clears throat> if you know the name of this per person, a particular individual, that's the best way to stop it. Weapons don't seem to really phase it, and even when people have hit these things with their vehicles going at like 75 or more miles an hour, you look in the rearview mirror and there's still a person in the road. There's not the dog that you hit. Or the wolf that you hit, there's this person crouched down kind of like a, like a squatting fetal position, basically. Um, so yeah, that's pretty interesting if you know the name. And how common is that, that you know the name of a skinwalker or somebody practicing this dark magic? And that being said, I think most skinwalkers are dark, but I don't think all of them are because... Um, you know, you do have to kill something that you love, which basically means a member of your family. Sometimes this is intentional and other times it's unintentional as far as when you're being born and your mom dies during childbirth, you still took the life of something you loved and you're able to practice that magic because of that. Um, and those are the good ones who just like to take these different forms and run and be free and have fun while others are encroaching on other people and trying to take their lives or, or whatever else. So this one is called the Yenald Lushi has found me. And it goes a little something like this. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious. For lack of a better word, she's not religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful. Typical boring old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window, and when someone would ask what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenald Lushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, were in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, 
insert little brother's name here, get away from that creature, it's not safe. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake. So we run outside to see my grandmother clutching my brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity I'd never seen before. It looked up at us and gave a little huff and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but do remember it had really deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened... She kept repeating, the Yenolushi has found me, and she moved a couple weeks after that. We got a few more minutes, um, and perhaps I can get through this story really quick. This one's called, A Coyote Walking on Two Legs. I was told this story once. My dad isn't a bull esser or a liar, so I know the story is true. So this was the very early 80s, and my sister, who lived in Toronto, came down to visit our parents for the weekend. She was staying at a friend's house who loaned her a car so she could come out. After her visit, she left a little after 9 p.m. She got maybe seven to eight miles away when the car broke down. Thankfully, she broke down in front of a friend of the family's house. They let her in to call Dad, and Dad came to get her. The family said she could leave the car in their driveway for the night, and my sister decided to just stay at my parents' for the night. It was now a little after 10 p.m. and pitch black, late November, when my sister and dad were driving back to the house and they passed through a heavily wooded area. Out of nowhere, they hear this incredibly effing loud, inhumane scream that was heard over the engine. Them talking and the radio. Dad slammed on the brakes and they both started freaking out. Then suddenly, a ten-foot-tall coyote walking on two legs with a black-and-white striped tail appeared on the side of the road and proceeded to walk in front of the car. As soon as it passed, that same scream played again, only this time ten times louder. Dan's, uh, Dad slammed on the accelerator, and they got the F out of there. It was never seen again. Um, and that reminds me of when my sister Amanda and I we're heading down to Phoenix in my to- Toyota Tercel, which I eventually wrecked off a 50-foot cliff. Um, but we were driving, and we actually went through Shiprock and then went a different route than I generally take anymore to get to Phoenix. And I didn't have a radio except for AM radio, which I didn't mind. I love AM music. I love the oldies. But uh, we were listening to TLC and all these other things on the boombox, and all of a sudden, outside of her window... Like they're saying, this inhumane, like crazy scream was coming uh, from her window, and it was just so freaky and insane. It just really, really freaked us out. So I just wanted to thank you guys for coming out tonight and um, trying to resurrect the tradition of telling ghost stories during Christmas time and. I know it's not Christmas Eve, it's not Christmas, it's the Christmas Eve before Christmas Eve, but I'm so glad that you guys were all here and hanging out with me, and um, and I'm so grateful for those of you that called in and shared your stories, and, and Kevin, I really love that um, amazing version of that story that you shared, it was pretty awesome. Good way to start off the holiday. And I want to thank you guys so much, and it was so wonderful having you on this evening, listening to my shenanigans, and trying to resurrect this old tradition of telling ghost stories during the Christmas season. And thank you to everyone in Space Out Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, Paranormal Radio, TalkStream Live, Deep Talk Radio, um, Noonan, Georgia, Louisiana, Revolution Radio. I had a wonderful time this evening, and it was my pleasure, literally and figuratively, and I can't wait to do it again next weekend on Spaced Out Radio at spacedoutradio.com, where we're going to have Mr. Bill Hauser in his ghost box this next Sunday, and we got a surprise guest for Saturday. Into the rocks and from the cliffs They watch us sink down in our thorny crowns Don't forget you guys We are all in this together Together we can make the world a little better And together my friends 
We own the night. Until next time, nighty night and love and light to all my space cases out there. You guys have a wonderful Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Um, and Happy New Year, although I'll see you this next weekend before the New Year kicks off. And if you guys want to come out for the Skype SOR Asylum After Party, we're going to be doing the 3 a.m. Siri uh, experiment, a.k.a. challenge, and we'll see what happens with that. I'm so afraid of messing with AI because I don't want to be in the human zoo. <laughs> um, and I already pissed off Siri not too long ago. But I hope you guys come out, and if you do, you can call from your cell phone, or you can call from Skype, and the number is 970-335-9596, 970-335-9596. Good night, guys. I know.